worship at First Presbyterian Church where our mission is to make disciples who love Christ, love one another, and love the city. If you're a first-time visitor, a special warm welcome to you. We want to give you a gift after worship. So stop by the Welcome Center in the Narthex or way over in the Mose Lobby. There will be a covenant partner waiting and excited to give you that gift. Lastly, make sure you take time to read through all of the announcements in the bulletin and find ways. There's lots going on in, in the life of First Presbyterian Church. Find ways that you can connect. Now I invite everyone to join me in the call to worship from Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let us pray. O God of grace, we gather in this sanctuary not because we are deserving of your love and not because we have lived faithfully before your face. We gather here this morning, eager to be transformed, because you have called us. You loved us before we could love you. You have given your Son for our salvation. For this we join all creation in adoring you, blessing you, praising you, thanking you. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, you are great and greatly to be praised. As we gather to offer our praise and adoration, transform us by the renewal of our minds, mold us into the image of your Son, whose death and resurrection gives us living hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this prayer in the strong and saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand if you are able. We'll sing our first hymn.
be seated. Let us join together in our call to confession from the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 21, which reads, what is true faith? Faith is a certain knowledge by which I'll accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. Faith is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me through the gospel. I trust that God has given the forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation to me and to others. This comes out of grace alone solely for the sake of Christ's saving work. Let us confess our sin to God, to one another, and then individually in silence. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. We have failed as your church, O God. You call us to live faithfully, act justly, and bring peace to the earth. Instead, our lives and your church... more of the needs and worries and less of the needs and worries of all peoples. Move us beyond ourselves to hear the cry of the world and to respond with acts and deeds of kindness, mercy, and justice. May your grace shine through a church that, even with its shortcomings, accepts the call of Christ to serve and care and love and bring peace. May we feel your forgiving spirit now. We pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear the good news from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Having confessed our sins before God and been assured of our forgiveness, let us now stand And affirm our faith together as we say the Apostles' Creed and begin by answering this question. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Allow me to add my greetings to those that you've already heard. Grace to you and peace in the name of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you here to First Presbyterian Church this morning. This is an exciting day for us. It's a wonderful moment of learning and growth for us, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that in just a second. But, but before I do that, I want us to take just a few minutes to consider how God has called us to enter into this season of our life together. We have just entered the Lenten season. That is, this time of preparation as we move forward to the, uh, as we move forward toward the celebration of Easter. 
And we are called here for this time to, to think about, to reflect upon, and to, to gather our thoughts, thoughts for, uh, for the preparation of this celebration of Easter. And if I may, I wanted to just draw our attention to the many announcements in our bulletin that will remind us of the things that are going on during this Easter season. But as we do, the first thing that I want to begin with is the understanding that, that we are a people of prayer and that God calls us at the beginning of this Lenten season to re-engage with prayer in a new way, not just as a petition, but as a claim of God's grace. Because whenever we pray, we do so in the sure and certain knowledge through Jesus Christ our Lord that our God hears us, that our God is not a God who having having told us to pray, will give us a, a snake if we ask for a fish or a scorpion if we ask for an egg, as Jesus said, but, but he hears our prayers and he takes them seriously. And so let us turn now to the Lord in prayer. And I would like to begin our prayer this morning with these words from Isaiah 43. Let us pray. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. O Lord, you are our Savior. And we may pray to you because you have called us by name. You created us. You formed us. And in that confidence, we approach the throne of grace, not simply as servants, but through your son, Jesus Christ, as your children. You have sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, that we may dare to impose upon your goodness. And so we come because... Lent reminds us of our great need for you. We are reminded, O oh Lord, as we drive in to church this morning, that there are many who are, who are struggling simply to survive, to find a place of shelter, to find the things that they need for everyday life. We are reminded, O oh God, as we turn on the news of, of all of the challenges that, that are at work in our world. Lord, here we are just one year after the invasion of Ukraine, and that war does not seem to be slowing down. Lord, we pray for our partners in Poland and their ministry to the Ukrainians. We ask you, Lord, to be with our partners all over the world as they struggle with the various challenges of persecution or need. Lord, we ask you to give them opportunities, but we also ask you, Lord, to give them what they need so that they may not only be safe, but so that they may advance your kingdom and, and so that they may truly know that you are with them every moment of the day. Lord, we ask you to be with this congregation as we seek not only to draw people into fellowship with this church, but as we seek to deepen our own relationships with you. Lord, let this weekend, let this, let this day, this, this Z Talks opportunity, this event, be an opportunity for us to dig our roots deeper into the soil of your truth. Because we do believe, O oh God, that as our roots go downward, we will continue to bear more fruit outward and upward. So, Lord, we, we come to you humbly, knowing that, that we do not deserve your favor, but so grateful, O oh God, that, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you have, that you have drawn us, young and old, into your service and we ask, O oh God, that you would help us to make disciples not only, not only in our own neighborhoods, but across this city. And Lord, we do pray for San Antonio. We pray for the neighborhoods, the ones that are close to us and the ones that are far away. Lord, we pray for your church spread throughout San Antonio, that you would give your bride the power of your Holy Spirit, that she may not only witness your truth, in a powerful way, but in a beautiful way, that we may lift up your son, Jesus Christ, so that all men will be drawn to him. And Lord, we ask you to 
be with us, to guard our hearts, to keep us humble, but Lord, to keep us energetic for the good work that you've called us to do. Most of all, O oh God, we see that across this country, you are stirring something. You are awakening movements. But most of all, Lord, you are touching the hearts of your people. Lord, I pray that every person here today would, would begin a renewal and a revival by receiving the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his love for us. Lord, we cannot love others until we have truly understood your love for us. And so we ask that you would just impress upon us, that you would make real to us what your Son has done for us. As we move through these weeks of Lent, oh God, we pray that you would remind us that, that we are not just people, we're not just a herd, but you, we are your children and you know us by name and have called us by name. So Lord, speak your truth to your servants that we may share it with one another and that we may share it with the world. Lord, we do turn to you and ask that that you would fill us with your power, your strength, and your guidance. And as we so often hear, Lord, we ask that you would help us to serve as Jesus served. We ask you, Lord, to help us to love as Jesus loved. And now, Lord, we ask you to help us to pray as Jesus prayed, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into the season of Lent, one of the things we want to do is remember that God has given us tangible exercises to worship him and to celebrate his giving his grace and one of the ways that we do that is through the offering in just a moment the ushers will be passing plates down your pews and that is not just an opportunity for us to collect funds for the mission of the church that is also an opportunity for us to remember that god has given us everything we have and that we are stewards of the many gifts that god's given us it's a reminder to us that god has blessed us to be a blessing. So as you're passing that plate, I ask you to do so as an act of worship, but I ask you also to consider this. There's also a fellowship pad at the end of your pew, and as you are passing that fellowship pad down your pew, I ask you to offer yourself to one another. Don't just pass that pad down, but look at the names on that pad and, and extend the right hand of fellowship to those people down the pew, the people especially that you do not know who may be first-timers here visiting or who may be seeking a church home or just, just in need of a little bit of acknowledgement. Would you please not only offer your, the Lord's tithes and our offerings, but would you also yourself to those who are seated next to you? At this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come and receive our offering as we share with the church God's tithe and our gifts.
our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We thank you for all that you have given us, and we ask now that you would help us to be good stewards of everything that you have entrusted to our care. Lord, may it bring glory to you and good to your people. Lord, receive these gifts as our offerings and what is due to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you're new with us here at First Presbyterian Church, you'll notice that the banner of our bulletin today is just a little bit different from the banner that you would ordinarily see containing the, the passage of Scripture or the, the sermon series uh, graphic or something like that. Today, you'll see that it says Z-Talks, the Zabendan Legacy Forum. That's because today is a special day in this sense. Today, we are, we are celebrating the life of the mind in service to God. The Apostle Peter wrote... Sanctify Christ as Lord and always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you and to do so with gentleness and reverence. We believe that, as Isaiah said, that as, as our roots grow downward into the soil, so will our fruit grow upward and outward. And we as a church want to make sure that we are not only broadening the spread of the Word of God, but we are deepening our own relationship to God and His Word. And that's why we, have, we take an opportunity every year, we set aside a weekend, to specifically think theologically. Now, what does that mean, to think theologically? It means that we, we contemplate what we believe, why we believe it, and what it means to seek understanding of our faith. You may remember that, uh, that in the Gospels, at one point, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And, of course, the home run answer given by Peter, the disciple and apostle, was, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that is a great, the perfect answer. But let me ask you this. If somebody were to ask you, okay, what does that mean? How would you answer them? What does it mean that he is the Christ? What does it mean that he is the son of the living God? That is where the exercise of theology comes into the life of the church as we consider what it means to explain and to share and to just relate the things that we believe in faith. Our late beloved pastor, Dr. Lewis Abendon, was a wonderful communicator of the Christian faith. And he felt that it was important not only that we know what we believe, but why we believe it. And so this year, as the second annual installment of the Z Talks or the Zabendan Legacy Forum uh, series, we are bringing to, to you Dr. Tom Gibbs, the Reverend Dr. Tom Gibbs. You may know Tom from his long tenure here in San Antonio, but Tom 
what has served as a campus minister. He has been a church planter. He has been a local congregational pastor, and now he is the president of Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Tom is a, uh, a graduate of Auburn University. He is also a twice graduate of Covenant Theological Seminary and is now serving as the president of his alma mater, which I think is always the dream for all of us. Um, but he is here today to share with us some thoughts not only in this service and in the 11 o'clock service, but also in, the, uh, in, a, uh, in a meeting following our luncheon today. So we hope that you will be here. Uh, that, well, you're already here for this one. We hope that you will come back for, uh, for his lecture following lunch. And at this time, I'd like to turn the pulpit over to you, Tom. Thank you, Bob. It's great to be with you. Greetings from Redeemer Presbyterian Church, your sister congregation down the street, as well as greetings from Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, a land much colder than um, our beloved city here in San Antonio. But we're um, transitioning uh, to that new calling, which is different than the one that I enjoyed here for 19 years uh, as serving as the planter and pastor of Redeemer uh, Presbyterian. And it is a joy to be with you, uh, not only to just be back in San Antonio, but also to reconnect with this congregation and the Zabendan family. Many of you, or may maybe some of you know, the final five years we were here in the city, we were neighbors uh, to Kip and Lewis, and um, they were in our home often. And it's, it was great to have uh, a meal with Kip last night as well as uh, the, the, the children and, and make those connections. My wife apologizes that she's not able to be here. She had another engagement in Atlanta this weekend, but uh, she uh, sends her greetings as well. Well, our passage this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 14. Doubtless, it will be familiar to you. Um, and as we think not only about the its meaning, I also want to think about its implication for our lives. Uh, Jesus' mission and what that mission means for each one of us as his people. Let's give our attention to God's holy word. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way where, to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God abides forever. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your word. This word that you spoke to your disciples even now are speaking this truth again to us, your people. And we pray that we would receive the blessing of these words. But you would also help us to see how these words enlist us in your mission in this world. That we might be your faithful disciples, making disciples as you have called us to do. We ask you would be with us now by your spirit and According to all of the glory and richness of your grace, we pray. Amen. For years, as I was pastoring at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, I also served our denomination as we would assess future church planting candidates. And, and part of the assessment process as we engaged with these church planters was that they had to give a brief uh, biblical um, evangelistic message. And I will tell you, I listen to a lot of those um, little homilies from these planter candidates, and most of them were, to be frank, uh, not very good. Um, but uh, one of these devotionals, one of these homilies has always stuck with me. It was by a Vietnamese American church planter candidate, and he was sharing the story of how he met who was going to be his future wife, this very typical uh, southern girl from the state of Georgia. He himself grew up in Atlanta, and he met um, his future wife on their first date, and she began to talk about uh, what was, uh, for us, uh, probably a very typical growing up experience. She had her own room, and she had a television in her room, and she had a telephone in her room, and we would, uh, to most of us, think not not much significance to any of those parts of her lives. But to this 
young man, it blew his mind. He, he couldn't imagine the privilege of having his own room. But you see, growing up as a Vietnamese American immigrant family, he had many siblings, and the room that he grew up in doubled not only as his bedroom in the night with his shared siblings, but also the common room that they used during the day. He said, all I ever wanted growing up was to have my own room, a protected space, a refuge to where he could return. You can imagine his amazement when later, after he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came across this passage from John chapter 14. And here we read about the God of the universe, the God of all creation, who has promised protected spaces, rooms, as it were, for this sinful and broken people in this world in an entirely new and different way. His mind was blown. But once more, I think it was the late Archbishop William Temple who said that the church, and I shared this yesterday afternoon, that the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not yet its members. That the church exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not yet its members. That though somewhat disturbing and counterintuitive, I think... This insight is biblically on target. In fact, I think it captures the sentiment of what Jesus is saying here. He has come not for himself, but rather he has come for us that we might share in the beautiful privilege of relationship that he himself has with his heavenly Father, that he might bring us into the presence of the triune God. Jesus is telling us that his mission is one of making room for the people that he will call to himself. Jesus has a making room mission. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because we just want to think about verse 6 and we race ahead to the sublimity of that verse. We don't give this metaphor of Jesus making room enough attention. And I want us to think about it this morning. And not only that, I want us to realize that this Metaphor that this image of God's saving mission in our lives of making room, it not only blesses us, but if you're a disciple, it enlists us. But once we enter into the privilege of that reconciled space, according to our God and His grace, that we're now called to join Him in that making room mission. I want to suggest to you there are three missional implications of what Jesus tells us here in John chapter 14. First, the hospitality that we offer. Secondly, the relationships that we form. And thirdly, the passageway that we uphold. Hospitality, relationships, and a passageway. As we think about the hospitality, its most basic level, hospitality is a mission of offering a safe space, a protected space. So we think about those immigrants crossing our border from Mexico into Texas, and we hear, hear the stories of them making their way through the scrub and the shrub and the, and the desolate parts of our state, and we recognize that they are not protected. They are often battling infection and disease and without water and without food, and many times that they lose their life, that they are homeless. And without help. And as we think about those tragic stories, that we're reminded of their humanity and our call. But, but even if we have everything that we need in this world, uh, and our physical uh, estates are beautifully um, garnished with the, the homes that, that we inhabit, the, the places that we frequent, the, the Bible says that we are destitute spiritually. That without Christ, that we are strangers to our covenant God. We are strangers, Paul writes to the Ephesians, to the promises of the covenant, having no hope and without God in the world. That we also need hospitality because of our estrangement from Christ and His mercy. It's to this situation that Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled, for in my Father's house are 
many rooms. The, the gospel's invitation is one of a gospel rest, offering hope to the sin-weary traveler in, in this world. Jesus is the hospitable one who offers us a protected space, a refuge. At its most basic level, Jesus is saying in that beautiful Latino hospitality, mi casa es su casa. My house is going to be your house. My place is going to be your place. Henri Nouwen, the late Henri Nouwen, says that hospitality, at its most basic level, means offering a free space where the stranger can become a friend instead of an enemy. Where the stranger can become a friend instead of an enemy. That's the promise Jesus is offering here. Rooms that are both protected and abundant. He says there are many rooms. I'm not sure what it is, but as Presbyterians, I think sometimes we miss out on how vast and expansive is the mercy of our God. Maybe it's the Jonah syndrome. We want to protect what's ours. And yet here Jesus is reminding us that there, there are many rooms. It's like the, the joke. Maybe you've heard of St. Peter as he was showing around the new class of, of, of those saints bought by grace around the halls of heaven. And, and there that they were seeing the, the, the surprising numbers of, of people from, from the various faith traditions. The, the, there were Baptists there. There were the Episcopalians the, the Bible church dispensationalists, they came across this one room, door closed, sign reading, Presbyterian. And Peter, Peter asked these new, um, these new participants, these new entrants to, to be, be quiet. Those are the Presbyterians. They think they're the only ones in here. <laughs> but, but Jesus says there are many rooms. Many rooms in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, according to the Abrahamic promise, that the, the, the halls of heaven will, will be filled with his people, his saints, that are like the stars of the sky, that the number like the sands of the shore. A number so vast that, that we cannot imagine the greatness of the mercy of our God. Abundant. And then he says that they are places for you. Places for you, he says. P protected, guarded. Kept in heaven. Here it's almost as if Peter is echoing the, the very words of Christ as he writes in that first epistle. He speaks about our everlasting eternal rest, that there is this place, uh, uh, the, 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 what is to come that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept. Kept in heaven. That which is guarded, that which is protected and reserved. And here, Jesus is saying that that place that he has, he has promised is kept for you, personally protected. This is the nature of the hospitality that our Savior offers to us. And of course, that, that is wonderfully encouraging and such a blessing. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you, you know that blessing and you claim that promise. But my question this morning, though, is not simply that it, that promise might bless you, but do you know that it enlists you? That, that we're summoned to participate with Jesus in that hospitable mission. What does it mean for us to engage with our Savior in the mission of hospitality? And at the very least, it means that we offer a safe space to the stranger who enters our doors. And I love to hear that y'all have a gift for your visitors. That means you've thought about the stranger. That we have understandable worship guides and good coffee and, and, and the, the conversations that, that we offer. That we're making room for, for those who have come to, our, come to our spaces. But it means more than that, right? The hospitality that we offer outside of these walls. It makes me think of the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh who in 2004 was killed in the Netherlands. 
by Muslim radicals. And, and at that point, the city erupted, or the, the country, in fact, erupted in domestic terrorism, Muslims and Christians and, and, and violence all across um, the, the country. And during that time, a, a traditional Dutch conservative uh, Protestant minister, his name was Kees Sembrande, and he, he lived in one of these Muslim neighborhoods where, where there was so much violence, and he walked down to the to the local mosque, and he knocked on the door where there were frightened Muslims gathered inside, and, and they opened the door, and to their amazement that this Protestant minister stood in front of them, and, and he said, I will stand guard at your door until the violence stops. And he did that for months. And other Protestant ministers went to their local mosque and they stood guard all throughout the country for, for more than three months until the violence it began to cease, reminding them, not agreeing with the tenets of, of Islam, but reminding them a, a banner that saying that in Christ there is a safe space that is offered as a gospel bridge. What, what, what are we doing to, to remind this world that there are many rooms promised to those who come and find refuge in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? How are we welcoming the biggest strangers among us? How are we showing the gospel hope to those around us, creating those safe spaces? Of course, Jesus has invited us uh, to him as the, as the chief physician to enter his hospital for sinners. But do we know that we then become the nurses and the doctors and the orderlies alongside of him in that mission? The hospitality that we offer, the relationships that we form, it's not just about a protected refuge, is it? It's about a saving relationship. Jesus comes to us and not only says, what I have is yours. That's hospitality. He goes on to say, what I am. Where I am is yours. Jesus makes room that, that enables us to enter into that most intimate of relationships that, that Jesus himself has with his heavenly Father. Verse 3, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. D do you see, he, he's bringing us into that conversation. He, he's bringing us into the very presence of his eternal and holy dwelling place. Yeah, and we don't have to get distracted here that thinking about the geography of heaven. We know in the glorious uh, new heavens and new earth, God will renew all things. Jesus here is not speaking about the geography of heaven so much as he's speaking about the architecture of its relationships. The glory of heaven will be that we'll be brought, brought into that a glorious communion that Jesus himself has with the Father. He is going to share that by virtue of his saving mission. We enter into that beautiful affection that the Father himself has towards us out of his great and abiding love. And for this reason, we can cry out, Abba, Father. But we're brought into that beautiful acceptance as a result of having been given the garments of acceptance purchased in and through Jesus. But, but hopefully that's not news to you. Uh, hopefully you, you've begun to hear that story of grace that we do enter into the the presence of the Father by virtue of the gift of Christ the, the Son. It, we are tasting the glory of that reconciliation. The question I have for you this morning is, do you want others to taste that glorious reconciliation? Do you want others to experience the blessedness of that reconciliation? We know from the story of Jonah that it's possible for the covenant people of God to be territorial about their privilege. Jonah did not want the Ninevites to enjoy the mercy and grace 
of his covenant God. He wanted it for himself. He didn't want to go to Nineveh, which, by the way, is Mosul in modern-day Iraq. So, so he fled, and God brought him back to that mission. But, but even at the end of the story of Jonah, he's frustrated after Nineveh repents. He says, oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. I knew that you were gracious. This is what I didn't want. He goes on, Therefore, O Lord, now, please take my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. It is better for me to die than to live and see your mercy and your grace. And friends... Have we become territorial about the grace that, that we have, that, that we experience it? Jonah couldn't imagine a world where God invited his hated enemies into intimate communion. So sometimes I wonder, not, not so much do we hate or do we want to resist those around us from coming and experiencing the blessedness of our salvation as much as we are just indifferent We meet the summons of Christ to join him in his mission with a meh. Not much there. Not much to do. But sometimes it stirs our our ire. As we think about those who disagree with us politically, that they're on that side of the issue, that side of the aisle. And we fear if they win or they get their way or, or something, then we're going to lose. It's a zero sum. They win, I lose. And so we tribe up. And we act out of fear. We have a scarcity mentality and we forget how abundant is the grace of the Lord our God and, and the joy He wants us to have in sharing relationship and building relationship with those around us. Redeemer Presbyterian Church, over 20 years, it started in my living room, just a few families, six or so. And all along the way, I would say to our members and those who would participate at Redeemer, are you open to having a new best friend? Or do you say, I've got my friends, we're good. The gospel is, is leading us to open our hearts, break our hearts, that we might have more room for more relationships. New best friends. Even as our Savior has made room for us, that we might be brought into the most intimate of communions with His Heavenly Father has become our Heavenly Father, that we might, with Him, cry out, Father, the relationships that we form, the hospitality that we offer, and finally, finally, the, the passageway that we uphold. We need to go back to Jonah and remember Jonah would have rather died than seen God extend grace to the Ninevites. He wanted to die to prevent grace. Jesus died to bring grace. As Paul writes in Romans 5, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. He died for us that He might bring us to our Heavenly Father. Jesus is, in fact, the passageway, and this is what He's referring to, this very important and familiar verse, verse 6. He says to the disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, Jesus has been referring to His death for many weeks now with the disciples, that they're in the upper room. This is the upper room discourse. He's telling them yet once more, and they've been missing it. And even now, Thomas is like, what are you talking about? How do we know the way? How do we know where you're going? We don't understand that they still had missed it. They still had missed it, that Jesus making room mission, mission was along a very particular pathway which Jesus summarizes with these three words, and we don't have time to unpack them, but, but they are 
a, a constellation, right, of explanation. Helping us understand what Jesus has done for us and for our salvation. He is the way through his death. His death. In place of the death that we deserve. He is the truth. He has fulfilled all righteousness through his life and his death. In a way that we have not. And through that death, he has brought us life that we might live evermore. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Without that work, we are not saved. This was the unique passageway, the only passageway, the narrow passageway. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. That we might be saved. If you've yet to hear that story, then perhaps today can be the day of your salvation. But even if we are saved, we need to reflect on that beautiful passageway that Jesus has performed for us. It makes me think of Ernest Gordon, the longtime dean of chapel at Princeton University in the 1950s. And there, as he served that role, he reflected upon his life as a Scottish soldier in the Pacific theater of World War II. And in that theater of war, he became a prisoner of war by the Japanese and suffered terrible conditions that de daily uh, uh, put his life at risk. And in his memoir, he tells the story how the Japanese were moving them in these work camps and making them perform various tasks. And in one of these particular um, days, the, the commanding officer of the Japanese gathered his company of men up and asked them to count the shovels, and one of the shovels was missing. And this infuriated the commanding officer, and, and he, he, he pulled one of the soldiers to the side and said, I'm going to start killing soldiers until you present the missing shovel. And none of the soldiers knew, knew where the shovels had gone. They, they didn't even think there was a missing shovel, but, but the, the, sol, the commanding officer was about to take the life of this soldier, and then finally one soldier steps forward and said, I did it. I took, the shovel. I took the shovel. And then the Japanese commanding officer, he holstered his revolver, and then he picked up one of the other remaining shovels, and he proceeded to beat that soldier to his death. And the company gathered their, their supplies up. They marched back to their camp, and then they counted up the shovels at once more and discovered there was, in fact, no missing shovel. Yeah, and they all realized, including Ernest Gordon, that that young man had given his life for their lives. Well, over an injustice. And yet what we have in the story of the gospel, of course, is to even greater degree and even with greater impact. Our Lord and Savior has loved us. Even though we deserved God's righteous wrath. Even though we, we were justly uh, accused. He, he came for us anyway. That he might stand in our place and bring us to our heavenly Father. For, for without that sacrifice, we could not be saved. But, but of course you know that. Right? We, we're a church that proclaims the glories of grace and the truths of the Scripture. That we know the story of our salvation. The question I want you to reflect on this morning is, do you want others to know that story? Are you zealous to share the story of our salvation? Are you joining Christ in upholding the passageway of salvation? Recognizing that this calls forth from us sacrifice, discomfort. 
It calls for us things that we would rather avoid. Not that we might sacrifice ourselves in order to merit or, or earn or, or somehow gain something from God. No, it's because we already have all of that. Because we already have His affection. We already have His love. We, we already have His grace. Our, our sacrifices are not made to get something from God, but because we have so much already. We give ourselves because of so much has been given to us. This is indeed how we join Jesus in this making room mission. We uphold the passageway of salvation by calling forth that passageway to the people of this world, by showing it in word and in deed, by giving up our comforts, that we might show the comfort that is found solely in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Probably shows my age a little bit, but I'm a fan of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I'm guessing some of you are too. My favorite song is the Southern Cross, which is a song about a lost love. And the best line comes in the last stanza, at least for me. It, it goes like this, and we never failed to fail. It was the easiest thing to do. But we never failed to fail. It was the easiest thing to do. Failing at our mission, no matter what it is, is always the easiest thing to do. Right? Be we mothers or fathers, or brothers, sisters, friends, or co-workers, employees, or bosses. Failing at our mission is the easiest thing to do because all we have to do is nothing. All we have to do is just Nothing. And as Christians, we often forget that even when we sometimes think we're being faithful and successful, and in our zeal, we end up up creating barriers and obstacles to the very ones Jesus called us to reach and go forth. David Brooks, in his most recent book, The Second Mountain, he talks about his own journey towards God. I was on a journey towards God. And along the way, I learned that religious people were, were... were some of them building ramps to make the journey easier. But others were building walls to make the journey harder. And this is my charge for us this morning. That we here at First Presbyterian Church or at Redeemer Church or all those churches that proclaim the name of Christ, that we would be about building ramps and bridges that not obstacles and walls, that we would sacrifice our own privilege and comfort, that we would be the most hospitable, that we would be the most open to relationship, and that we would be the most clear, that we would be proclaiming the glories of the gospel, what Christ has done for us and for our salvation, that we might not only enjoy the blessedness of the room Jesus has made for us, but that we would join him in his making room mission. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Pray now that you would apply this word spoken and applied to our hearts, that you would make us receptive and soft to how you would enlist us in your service of your kingdom. Thank you for First Presbyterian Church. May the gospel flourish here. May it grow and strengthen and multiply for your glory and our great and abiding joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and respond uh, with the song of Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He's my light, my strength, and my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of Come.
privilege that I was able to be with you this morning, and now I want to send you out the great blessing of our God who arms us with his grace. Lift your hands and look up. May, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.
information, please visit our website, fpcsanantonio.org, for all the information about how to get involved. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have a blessed week. Sorry, I, I took it and I was too, too bit too early. Right, right, right there.